Uh, Martin took out his pipe and then he took out the, the, the matches and he lighted a match. And this was a December night now, dark, calm, calm December night. And Martin lighted the match and he held it for a while. And there it was, this little flame in the dark night. And it was so vulnerable and so tender in some way. And it didn't seem to illuminate the dark. It didn't turn the darkness into itself or it didn't even desire to turn the darkness into itself, to transform the darkness. It had no imperial intentions in relation to the dark. It's just sat there, this little flame in the night, and it merely pushed the darkness, as it didn't even push the darkness away, the darkness almost backed away a little bit and gave it room and I thought of the wonderful vulnerability of the light and then Martin lit, light his pipe and was puffing away and after a while then out comes I knew what was going to happen, Martin would pull out his little bottle to get a bottle of whiskey that he was bringing home with him, so he started drinking that and um, I have I've had a few drinks of that and Martin said, you have me Kilt, John. Now, not K-I-L-L-E-D at all, but K-I-L-T. You hammy kilt, John. You hammy kilt. You're a grand man and a fine man and you're a great neighbour and we're delighted, we're delighted to have you living where you're living below there amongst us, but you hammy kilt. Yes, you've guessed it. You're back at the altar of County Kerry's meandering mystic, Babaji himself, John Moriarty, Ireland's major swami, seer and sadhu, whose books, recordings and radio programmes made such an impact in Ireland in the 1990s, but who is sadly less celebrated now. His gorgeous way of describing things in threes, the magic number in so many cultures, reminds me of a story he tells of a friend in Connemara describing a woman. And he said, wasn't she, he was talking about a girl then in the bar who'd sung songs, you know, and wasn't she a fine girl and a grand girl and a mighty girl? Do you know, in the old days, in the Fianna Fianniach, on Fariga, Fad Luim, Nut Luim, Dainach, you can't just say, it is ungenerous to say that a, a young a woman is a grand girl. Christ, you have to go on and on and on. She's a grand girl and she's a fine girl and she's a mighty girl and she the Lord save us from the wind. She took her, wasn't her father a mighty man? Her grandfather didn't know them, weren't they all grand people? And that song she sung, John, wouldn't you stand naked? It in the snow listening to it. You know, and he said, sing me one verse of that song. So I had to stand there and sing Martin one verse of Loch Sheed inside. And how proud was I of my girl so tall. I was envied mostly by young men all when I brought her blushing with bashful pride to my cottage home by Loch Sheed inside. Brilliant. I just wonder what Yeats would have made of Moriarty. I'd give anything to see that encounter. Would he have thought he had stumbled upon an actual druid, had him plucked, stuffed and mounted in the National Museum? But my feeling is that in this, the fourth episode of this mini-series, we're ready for some deeper Moriarty material. How would you feel if I dropped a solid four-minute piece on you? Four, maybe five minutes of soaring, searing, circuitous Moriarty meanderings about crookedness in a world of the straight-edged slide rule. I think you can handle it. If you got this far on this aural journey with me, I'm confident you're going to sail through. Though, if you are just joining, jumping on raw and uninitiated, you may want to track back a bit through earlier episodes. Don't let me be the boss of you. It's entirely your own affair. If you feel you can handle it, even without the precursors, you're entirely welcome to stay with us here on the journey with Guruji, with the great Swami Moriarty, Ireland's Ram Das, our very own Terence McKenna. To set the scene, he's been talking about his time working, washing dishes in Balnehinge Castle in Connemara, and how he saw a local handyman who wasn't known for his neatness laying a bit of non-slip flooring in the kitchen to make it safer for staff. Moriarty begins to judge the man's work, thinking it wasn't straight, that he wasn't using his slide rule correctly. And that set him thinking about his own straightness and his crookedness. If someone were to put that slide rule to me, I'd say, yes, of course I'm crooked. I am crooked. I can see. By the slide rule with which you measure me, I am crooked. But it isn't me that's wrong. It's the slide rule that's wrong. I'm on top of the Rada Hill, I'm in Thai, and I'm looking down at this wonderful crooked world, and I'm looking at the crooked Olmore River, and I think of the Jesus. It, 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 it falls down the side of five different mountains, and then it, it congregates into and coheres into Aina, Aina Lake, and then it comes through a little gorge, and it comes down into Derry Clare Lake, and then it comes through another little river, and, 
uh, river runs out of that and runs into Ban Hinch Lake and then flows down in front of my house, but it flows down by the road and it's everywhere. It is pitched from one bank to another and it's broken against this rock and it's broken against that rock and it's a great stiff-necked, turbulent river when there's a lot of, when there's been three nights or three days of rain uh, in the mountains. And, but always after coming out of the great brokennesses of its fords, um, of its rocky, of its rocky beds, it coheres into a wonderful mirroring. There it is again and all its woundedness is healed in a new pool and sometimes a salmon will leap in that pool and you see the rings spreading out to both banks and sometimes like I'm walking up the road and I see that mirroring the sky and it's mirroring the buds and it's mirroring Petey Welch and it's mirroring Petey Welch's sheep and it's mirroring me even though I can't see that it's mirroring me because I would need to be on the other bank to see me being mirrored. But then again it, it goes another direction and it's a very crooked river but sometimes but always it is making its way down to the great ocean whereas for all its straightness the Royal Canal, the Lord save us the Royal Canal leaves Dublin only in order to end up in Mullingar. You know, and why would anyone want ever to leave Dublin only in order to end up in Mullingar? Or the engineered straight roads of the, the autobahns in Germany, they leave, you leave Dusseldorf only to end up in Frankfurt and Maine. And the Lord save us, why would anyone ever want to leave Dusseldorf only in order to end up in Frankfurt and Maine? So with all our engineered straightness, I mean, the modern world where we eliminate, we rationalise everything, we eliminate all these contra- contradictions. But maybe it is true that... I mean, without without contraries, without contradictions and contraries, there is no growing. So I'm up in Dorada Hill, and I'm thinking of that voice that says, make straight the way of the Lord. And I'm looking at the Ormore River, and I'm thinking of Bill Joyce's answer. This is a lovely old castle, John. It's a lovely old place. And in lovely old places like this, the only good way to cut anything straight is to cut it crooked. And now I'm up in this wonderful crooked world, and I think it's beautiful. Connemara is beautiful because of its crookednesses. I mean, people don't so often go to Meath with all its flatness and Gildare, with all its flatness and the Curra, with all its flatness. It's the very crookedness of Connemara somehow that, that, that is part of its giftedness. I'm up under Rada Hill, and I'm thinking of Bill Joyce's answer. I'm looking at the Ownmore River, and I'm saying to myself, Echoing Bill, this is a lovely old world, John. It's a lovely old world. And in lovely old worlds like this, maybe, maybe, and I'm only saying maybe. I'm not being dogmatic here now. I'm saying maybe. Maybe the only good way to be straight in this world is to be crooked, giftedly crooked, to accept your crookedness giftedly crooked, marvellously crooked in the way that the Ownmore River is crooked. As a Christian, I can inherit that crookedness because I know now, looking down at the Ownmore River, that all for all its crookednesses, it is going down into the bliss of self-loss in the divine ocean. And when it comes into the ocean, the ocean is going to say, did you come a straight way? Were you a royal canal? Straight in your coming. Did you come straight here? Or did you come a crooked way here? The ocean, I think, will just open out its, its vastness and let the own more river that we all are in some sense. You put a slide rule to the own more river and you put a tool in the to its growing and it sounds through the Lord save us it's crooked. But it isn't the old more river that's, that's wrong. It's the slide rule that's wrong. And to turn the old more river into a canal would be an awful shame. So all the time it's making its way to make a long story short. It's a lovely old world, John. It's a lovely old world and maybe the only good way to be straight in this world is to be crooked. Giftedly crooked, marvellously crooked, in the way that the Ownmore River is crooked. Because all the time, the Ownmore River is finding its way down into the bliss of acceptance and self-loss in the divine ocean. Okay, I want to take you back to the last episode. Well, you might remember Moriarty decided to walk away from his old life, to start afresh. And then, as soon as he left, he began to get cold feet. Here, here's a snippet from that chat, just to to jog your memory. So I walk up the road. I have walked out now. I walk up the road. I am poor in spirit now. I'm poor externally and poor inwardly now, poor doctrinally and poor materially. And I walk up the road, having given all, having that all that I am, or have fallen to the ground. And five miles up the road, there's a thin wind blowing, and I think, Christ, have I really walked out? And I'm wondering, must I now never again worry where the night falls on me or where the day breaks on me? Where the night falls on me now or where the day breaks on me must not be a concern of mine. I must no longer ever concern myself with this now. But there's a thin wind blowing as, as, as I walk, continue to walk out. So I'm, I'm wondering, can I call my own bluff now? Have I actually walked out? But this thin, cold wind is blowing and there's a reek of turf and I sigh, I'll sit down by the reek of turf for a while. So he sits there by the reek of turf. 
the heap of peat, the bank of brown sods of compacted earth with his whole life ahead of him. And we wonder what's going to happen to him. Would he soar or sink or both? Or maybe there's a third way. Now, this next piece may not actually be aligned according to the admittedly rather chaotic chronology of his story, but it somehow makes sense in my mind that this piece should come next. It's from a time when he lies back on the earth in the same place, but maybe on a different day. Anyway, here goes. And as I lay back there, lying on the stick-strewn, leaf-strewn, chestnut-strewn earth, I was wondering, I was, I was aware that down, deep down, and not so deep, but certainly uh, superficially deep in this soil now, there are all these daffodil bulbs, and they are now breaking, they are now budding. And come next April, they will be overground and they will be blooming. But now they're there, and they're, they're, they're ceasing to be dormant now. They're coming alive now. And here are all these bulbs of consciousness that I'm lying on. And I was just wondering, are there dormancies within me? Are there bulbs of consciousness, bulbs of yellow consciousness, bulbs of sapphire blue consciousness, bulbs of emerald green consciousness, bulbs of of seventh heaven consciousness in me? And we know like that when a kitten is born, uh, it's blind for the first nine days, isn't it? Now, are there senses and faculties in me that just don't remain dormant for nine days? They might remain dormant for nine lives or 99 lives or, you know... 99 to the power of nine incarnations, that these faculties or or whatever you'd like to call them remain dormant in me. I mean, sometimes like I would imagine someone walking down to Ballybunny and walking down the beach in Ballybunny and standing ankle deep in the ocean and saying the ocean is ankle deep, but the ocean is infinitely deeper than it is, than, than, than ankle deepness. So are we mostly only ankle deep in our own nature? Are there immensities in our own nature? Now, Hindus and Buddhists and Oriental people generally, they talk about chakras, that there are, in fact, bulbs, if you like, of consciousness within us. They call them the chakras. And that if you live a particular kind of life, and maybe if you practice kundalini yoga, that these chakras, one by one, beginning with the Maladhara chakra, that they will open. And when the, when, when the Sahasrara chakra, the thousand-petal lotus chakra, at the crown of the head, when that opens, then you have, you, you're, you, you've experienced Radha Bhava, if you like, you've experienced bliss then. So are there infinite, infinite reaches of consciousness inside, are other modes of consciousness inside of us, other bulbs of consciousness inside of us that we, that never ripen us? Are we, are we largely dormant um, in, 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 throughout most of our incarnations? Are we largely dormant through most of our incarnations? That's the question. God, Moriarty would have been great on TikTok. He would have had followers and worshippers from here to, I don't know, to Timbuktu. His problem was that he was ahead of his time. And like every good guru or sadhu, he didn't have a clue how to edit himself, when to stop, how to shape his wisdom into bite-sized nuggets of brilliance. I'm going to leave you with one final piece, an encounter John had with a traveller woman who knocked at his door. Now, there's so much I want to say about this piece, but there's really no need to say anything at all. No lame editorialising by me is going to add any additional light or worth to his account. I'll just leave it with you for what it's worth. You've been listening to the Bog Prophet Manachan on Moriarty. As with the three previous episodes, I urge you to check out more of his work if you've caught the bug in any way. There's a wonderful biography titled not the whole story, by his close friend Mary McGillicuddy, as well as his own books, his radio programs, recordings. There's also an illuminating profile documentary, Dreamtime Revisited, by Donal O'Kelleher, available from Anu Pictures. And Lorna Hill's Conversations with My Godfather, which you can see on YouTube. There's also an increasingly large gathering of Moriarty material being amassed at the John Moriarty Institute for Ecology and Spirituality, which can be found at www.johnmoriarty.ie. Anyway, Shine Mochidse Gafolin, that's my lot for the moment. Toge Gaboge, take it handy. Here, I'm going to leave you with John telling you one more story 
for the road. Sometime in the late afternoon, it was a November day, a grey November day in Connemara. I had a brisk hip clop of hooves coming down the road and I looked out as the drew nearer, I looked out the window and there was five gypsy caravans moving beautifully past my window and there was a lovely, lovely motion in their moving as they moved past and I knew where they were going. This wonderful colour now has come into the, to the, to the townland and they were going up to the commonage just beyond the well field. So this was a quiet, quiet day, Sunday afternoon in Connemara, but now there was great colour in the village and there was great life in the village. Um, there, was, there, was a, there was a feast for hearing and seeing in the village because up the road now I could hear the, the, the young gypsies shouting and crying and baying and fighting and ponies neighing and dogs barking. So there was great life in the village. And uh, after a while I had a knocking at my door and I said, come in. And the door opened and there was a woman dressed in a tartan shawl. And I don't know whether I was half hallucinating or what I was doing. I wasn't actually, but um, there was an immense radiance. It was a woman, but she was dressed in this tartan shawl. And it was like a wonderful radiance standing there in the door. And she said, good evening, Your Honour. And I said, good evening to you. Come in. And she came in. And we were talking. And But there was most of my mind and most of my psyche was trying to find a name for what was standing in my door and for what, for what had, the, the reality that had come through my door. And, you know, sometimes you, you're, your mind is doing two things at once. You're actually, the surface part of your mind is talking to the woman, but at the deeper levels and at other levels, I was trying to find a name for her because this was, there was some kind of need to name her. And because I'd been thinking about chakras and inner immensities of the time and the opening of chakras, opening of these other kinds and types of consciousness, suddenly, um, almost without seeking it, I found myself saying, the woman standing at my door is dressed in the shawl of all our chakras. In most of us, the chakras, the chakras are asleep, but in her they have opened and not only they have come to the surface and they've come out and she's wearing them like a shawl. And it's a shawl of immense and tremendous radiance. And sometimes... I remember in, in northern Canada, in Canada, when I was there, I would see, sometimes you go out in the night and you would see, you would chance to see, happen to see and be delighted to see the, the northern lights, these great auroras, they would call them. Um, you know, these great curtains of light, the northern lights moving there across the sky. And... Um, you would, but you would say there, these are cosmic external auroras, but there are also auroras of soul, auroras of inwardness. Mostly they are so far away that we aren't aware of them. And sometimes I imagine that the people who built Shark Cathedral, they were building soul auroras. There is soul in us, and those soul can put on an immense display. And in some sense, she was wearing... She was wearing the shawl of all our chakras that night, she, that, that evening. She was, that afternoon, she was wearing the shawl of our inner soul, our auras that day. So this great radiance, this great light was standing and had come into my room. <laughs> 